But hello, how's it? How's everybody tonight? I'm doing great. I hope you are as well. We're going to have a little fun and talk about um, take answer a few questions that I've had recently, and we are going to tie a scarf or two, and we are going to discuss some travel. Oh my gosh, traveling today! How to stay polite while you're traveling and anything else you might like to talk about tonight. So thank you for tuning in. And first to start, I think we have a few people coming in, so let's just wait just a moment while people get ready to join us. And in the meanwhile, let may I introduce myself. My name is Heidi Dulaban, and I am a lifelong traveler, a learner, and all things etiquette. Um, I, I love exploring new places, new, new cultures, uh, new sights, sounds, smells, languages, to hear everything. I'm constantly trying to find something new and learn something every day. So it's, it's lovely that you're with me. I have all the credentials. I can tick all the boxes that, yes, protocol, etiquette. I have all of that, a lifetime of experience, and I just love to share that with you. So thank you so much. I, my philosophy about etiquette, I am an, an etiquette expert, if you will. <laughs> and let me just say that my version of etiquette is, yes, I can tell you all the knives and forks and how wear your, your napkin and when you toast and not toast. Yes, I can certainly tell you all of that. And it's great to know. But at its core, etiquette is about being kind and caring and respectful. That's the bottom line. And don't take yourself so seriously. You know, I mean, lighten up a little bit. This is life, it's short, and just just be respectful and appreciate other people. So that that is our main thing, the main message that I'm trying to say tonight. So I'd like to answer a few questions that I have received recently. And if you have anything, please, I will watch here, please put them in the chat, and I'd be very happy to, to read anything that you've got, answer any, any questions you have regarding etiquette. And also, I can make a point that etiquette is in every single thing we do. You know, we're practicing etiquette right now. I'm speaking, you're listening, what a skill. You know, few people are just excellent listeners, very few. Everybody thinks they're a great listener, but that is practicing etiquette. When you wake up in the morning, you say good morning to whomever might be in the household with you. And if nobody, when you walk out the door, when you're polite, that is practicing etiquette. So any questions you have, I would love to answer them. So let's just take a look at some that I've just received very recently. Um, here's one. Um, I received this today and it said, um, is it all right to buy something that is not on the gift registry? Okay, maybe it's a wedding, maybe it's a baby shower, you know, regardless, there, there is a registry. Is it okay to buy the gift that's not on the registry? That's such a good question. And I think that the answer, my opinion is, yes, it's okay on two occasions. I think the safe route, the best route, is always to buy something from the gift registry. You know, that you know that uh, the gift will be well received. It's something they want and need, regardless of the situation, wedding, shower, whatever it is, maybe a new home. So, okay, so gift registry is the way to go. But if you wanna go off registry, two, two occasions. One is you know the family extremely well. You are extremely close to, to, the, to the, the people having the shower, or whatever kind it is. And you know for sure that they might like to have something else and you know exactly what that item is. That case, it's great. Okay, second is the gift of money. You know, money, one size fits all and people love that and that's hard to turn down. So money is, I think, always um, a, a nice choice in, in a very, um, uh, lovely manner. You know, don't just hand somebody some money, but you can um, get that to them in a very nice manner. And beware though that so many registries today, 
there is a cash registries. You know, uh, for weddings, for example, they are, have uh, registries that where you can help fund the, the honeymoon. You can actually pay for like say, um, hot air balloon ride or something. Or they have um, towards our down payment for our her first house, things like that. So be aware, uh, there are other ways to, to give money that is maybe a little bit more, uh, less crass, if you will, you know, that, but I don't know, people, you know, it's a check is always kind of nice. So thank you so much for that question today. It was a really good one. Um, another question I had is, oh, here's a good one. Um, I just did a video about how to tell someone they have something in their teeth, you know, and now someone said, I watched your video. Now, how do you tell someone their fly is open? Oh, okay, is it the same? Yes, actually it is the same. So if you're with someone and unfortunately there's a little something in their teeth, you know, don't make a big deal. Don't put your hand up and whisper. That is very rude. That's actually the height of rudeness to whisper in front of other people. So you wouldn't do that. You would just get someone's attention and just say, I'm sorry, there's a little something in your teeth. And same thing, just lean over to someone and just, just not this big, you know, whisper like there's secrets going on. No, just a quick little whisper. You know, you might run into your bathroom. I think uh, your zipper's undone. And that is a favor to someone. Um, wouldn't you want someone to do that for you? You know, that's how I always look at these things. So good question. Um, here's another one sort of along those lines. Uh, during a business meeting meal, when is it appropriate to go to the bathroom? Well, you know, there are certain cultures where once you sit down, you don't get up. Um, but let's just say this is in a Western world and you're sitting there and it's okay to excuse yourself every now and then to go to the restroom. My advice is wait for a course change. Maybe they're switching out the salad and the main plate is coming. Good time in between courses to pop up discreetly you don't have to make a big announcement, just pop up discreetly, excuse yourself, run to the restroom, and come back, and remember where your napkin goes, though, on the seat, come back, pick the napkin up off your seat, sit down quietly, and just join back in the conversation. Um, sometimes if something happens, hits you, and you, you just need, to, you can't wait for a course change, well then, yes, of course, just again, discreetly pop up and uh, be as brief as you can. Just, you know, don't be gone for too long. So all these good questions. Let's see another one that I had. Oh, I just had this yesterday. And this is such a good question. Um, these were from uh, two young people. Uh, and they said, I love pearls. And I see that you like pearls. Yes, I'm a pearl kind of gal. I just love them. And they said, can you wear pearls at any age? And the answer is, heck yes. Yes, you can wear pearls at any age. Pearls, I just absolutely love pearls and they look good on anybody at any time. And I just attended a really neat webinar about two weeks ago. And they're it was about men's fashion throughout the uh, history. And how in the 1500s we saw pictures of uber wealthy men and part of the attire were strands of pearls. I mean strands and strands, think Coco Chanel, you know, on steroids, strands and strands of pearls. And they were so long they'd be even tied, you know, like maybe you would today. It looked very cool on these men and even some of their, their um, clothing were embellished with, with pearls all over them. So men can wear pearls, women can wear pearls, young, old, any age. It is sort of that quintessential accessory. You dress it up, you dress it down, it goes with jeans, it goes with your favorite little black dress. And I have noticed more men wearing pearls. Have you noticed that? During the Queen's Jubilee, you know, I was, of course, really excited about that. And I kept seeing a lot of interviews and performances by Rod, Sir Rod Stewart. And Rod Stewart has been wearing a, a, a choker of pearls lately. And I thought, wow, that's kind of cool. And he, looked, he, he could, of course, pull it off. He looked great. 
And I was just abroad in Europe um, just a few days ago, and I noticed some men with with strings of pearls, and they looked great. I mean, really very handsome, cool looking young guys. So, you know, pearls, they're for all of us. You know, wear them anytime you want. Actually, the more you wear pearls, the better for the luster, you know, so, so remember that. But they're delicate, take care of them. Never shower with them, don't sleep in them. Take good care and don't pour perfume over them. You could, the pearls, you know, they're, they're delicate. So yeah, wear pearls anytime, any age, any gender, they're for all of us. Okay, we had another question is um, cocktails. Um, is that really an American term and concept? Yes, it is. You know, cocktails, that is such a cool, uh, I just love that. It's just very cool that anyone can um, make a cocktail and if you're over 21. And the history is really interesting. If you want to get into it, the history of cocktails, it is an American creation. Uh, cocktails, there's so many, there's a lot of um, ideas, um, a, lot, a, lot, a lot of suggestions. How did we get that term cocktail? Lots of different ways, and that's a whole video, that's a whole Q&A in itself. How did we get this term cocktails? But suffice it to say, it became cocktails. And in the 1800s, uh, bar people, mostly men, but there were a few women, and they referred to themselves, this is in the 1800s in the United States, they referred to themselves as mixologist. So mixologist, that's nothing new. That's been around for you know over 100 years. And then during Prohibition here in the United States in the early part of the, the 1920s into the early 30s, um, and alcohol was banned, it was prohibited, Prohibition, the cocktail culture moved to Europe and it was all the rage. And a lot of Americans went to, to France and to England and they made their fortunes in the cocktail business. And, th and it's kind of a cool story. Le um, Latous Lautrec, Le okay, the artist, famous artist, he was quite a mixologist. He even worked parties. Here he was a very famous artist, and he would go to parties and be the mixologist because he loved to show off his skills, and he had all these different cocktails, and Latous Lautrec, he was really quite the barman. And there is a legendary party story where he made 1,000 cocktails and it was told the party went on for days and days and it was really quite, quite the event. So yes, cocktail, and we did a, a video about cocktail attire and from cocktails, it became attire. You wanted to go to a cocktail party. People used to have them in their homes all the time and you didn't want to wear what you wore to work or what you wore during the day. So, but it was not a super formal thing. So you would wear something in between. And then, you know, then we had, think of, you know, further back, think of in the twenties, the uh, roaring twenties in the United States, think of flappers. They were called drinking women. And before that, women were not to be drinking out in public. And the drinking women said, get the heck with that. We're going to drink in public. And they went to speakeasies, prohibition, and they had that certain dress. It was not formal. It was not what you, you wore to work that day. It was that other in between and thus cocktail attire. So it's, it's kind of neat how these things come up. And that is truly an American invention. And yeah, we should do a whole... Uh, Q&A about it because I could talk all night about it. It's fascinating actually. It's really fascinating. Okay, so let's talk about another. Oh, this was interesting because I'm also into coffee and Scandinavians drink the most coffee. Yes, that's true. Uh, why is that? Is it the weather, the culture, or both? Well, actually, um, I think it's probably a little bit of all of the above. 
Uh, I, you know, I can't quite know for sure, but I can know for sure that Scandinavians do routinely drink the most coffee in the world. It sort of vacillates between the different Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands. Um, and the Netherlands makes sense because they, the Dutch East India Company was one of the first companies to bring coffee from the Ottoman Empire and the Arabian Peninsula to Europe. So that makes sense. They've been drinking coffee for a long time. And in Scandinavia, I think, yes, it's cold, but I think it's part of the culture. It's simply part of the culture in any of the Scandinavian countries. And in Sweden, in particular, it is, it's, it's such a part of the culture, they have a term for it. It is both a verb and a noun, and it's called fika, F-I-K-A. And fika means to meet with somebody, converse, drink coffee, maybe have a little cake, and it's also the act of doing that. So it's a noun and a verb. And in Sweden, and I ha I've had some viewers write in to me, and I had read this, and they confirm it, that in union contracts, uh, employment contracts in Sweden, it is written in that there are two extra coffee breaks per day. It is this ingrained part of the culture. So yes, coffee, Oh gosh, how long do we have? I, I love the history of coffee. I love drinking coffee. I love everything about coffee. And you know, once you dive into the history of coffee, you just really appreciate it. You know, it's, it was um, a Muslim creation coffee, but it was influenced by the Chinese because this mystic sect called Sufis uh, in um, Yemen, where there is the port of Mocha, yes, that the Sufis, they were very learned sect, but they traveled, they were not cloistered, and, and they, some of them ended up going um, with the fleets to China to help with some intellectual projects, and they saw the Chinese steeping tea leaves, yes, in little small cups with no handles, just of what you think of today, and Sufis came back, they said, we've been just sort of burning these cherry berries, let's put them in boiling water. Chinese influence spanned the world by Europeans, the Dutch East India Company, and the, the Brits, the East India Company, embraced by the Europeans, finally gets to America, and it's a you know good old cup of American Joe, but we've been drinking coffee around the world, especially in the Arabian Peninsula for thousand, a thousand years. So it's very cool history. So very cool now that, you know, Scandinavians, they drink way more than, than we do. That here's a little fun fact. Generally speaking, Americans, okay, we drink a lot of coffee. That's right. I'm an American. We drink a lot of coffee, but generally speaking, we can, you know, drill it down and be more, but generally, Europeans drink twice as much coffee as Americans. And Scandinavians, they drink twice as much coffee as the Europeans. That's how much coffee they drink. So I know, I love it there. It's just, it suits me, I think, very well. The weather probably do. It's been so warm, let me just tell you. Um, so I've had a few things. Oh, I just had this, this was a very good question. I, today, this very day, I had this question. And it is, um, is it okay to use a knife to eat a meaty lasagna? Because I just did a video about if you're in Italy and you're served a lovely big plate of spaghetti or linguine, you do you twirl, it's all in the twirl, and you do not cut that. You do not cut this long spaghetti with a knife. But if you're having a lasagna and it's you know big and hearty and and you know all meaty and there are big pieces in there and yes lasagna some of the the, the noodles are big so yes of course that is fine it's okay to use your knife to cut that but generally speaking with the spaghetti just learn the twirl no spoon by the way the italians don't use the spoon i think it's just in the movies but no no you twirl just take, and here's the tip that nobody tells you. When you're doing the twirl with the spaghetti, sort of move one strand maybe, just one or two strands in the tines of your fork and move it over sort of to the side of your plate and then just twirl it and pick it up. Easy, if you go right in the middle and you try to get a, a, a 
a lot of strands of spaghetti, let's say, it's too hard, it's too hard. So that's the tip, nobody tells you. A strand or two, move it over to the, the side of the plate, put the fork down so it just sort of hits the bottom of the plate, twirl, 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 easy peasy. You won't need a knife for that, but lasagna or a big ravioli, I've had big raviolis where you need a knife, of course, then that's fine, that's fine. But that's a very good question and very much thank you to our viewer for, for watching the video to ask that question. So I, let's see, um, uh, those are the few I had the last couple of days. And let me just tell you, I do have someone who has, you know, I'm here in the United States, but you know, there are a lot of folks that live in the Southern Hemisphere and they're in winter. And while we're in scorching temperatures, you know, I'm in um, the Southeast of the United States, been extremely hot here. And I was just in Paris and I I couldn't believe the heat. It was at 97, 104, you know, 106. This is, you know, unbelievable. 40 degrees, you know, 42 degrees. It was, it was so hot. Um, so, but, but that's just here. There are parts of the world, it is still winter. And I've had a viewer ask me how to tie a scarf um, for her now that um, that's warm. So I'm just gonna give you my, so you take your scarf and you know, just fold it over, one big loop, if you can see. Okay, have the loop around. This is the classic, we all know this, but it's, it's, a, it's a classic for a reason. You take the two ends, they go through the middle, and then fix it up. You know, if I had a nice mirror here, I could see it would be there. Okay, that's nice, okay. I have another one for you, same thing, loop, just take one end through, okay, just like you would. The other end, instead of going just through, go from the top in and then pull that and you get this different, really kind of nice looking knot. So that will work very well too. And it's warm. I mean, this is right up there, but it's a nice knot. It's not just all big messy thing for you. So we'll go over that again. Um, when it is winter in this hemisphere as well. And then she, um, she's asked about her head. She's riding motorcycles. And I would say just put it over your head and around here, a back and tie it there. And then the flaps are, are going in the wind while you're on your motorcycle. It looks neat. And if it's super long, you can bring it back again and tie it here. And we did make a video about this. This will be out in uh, August next month and and I have a nice big long scarf and do that so you can see a little bit more of that And I'd like to just take a moment. Oh, and I have one more because I have um, a nice young man he tells me that he is a fashion student and he would like to know about ascots and ascots um, are, are very interesting they're not as much in vogue there was a time when they were very much in vogue and you saw mostly men would wear an ascot. And he asked, how does it look? What is it? And do women wear an ascot? So I, um, I'm gonna just show you what it would be like. So I just have one of my scarves and I've just done it in one big long, one long sort of a sausage. And I'm gonna take it around my neck, have one side a little longer than the other bring it around, and then you just sort of spread it out, put it into your shirt, and then this is sort of, a, this is what they call an ascot. And it is, yes, mostly men wore this, spread this out. Okay, and here was the, but some women could too. So this was considered an informal tie for men. This was not formal, this was not getting all dressed up, not wearing the traditional necktie. This was for what I, I call this high cash. You know, it's very high casual. You, you wanna be put together, but you're not really dressed up, but this makes you just a little more dressed up. Okay, so I was on this trip uh, to Paris on the plane on the way back, I had not seen, um, the Gucci movie, the family about uh, the movie about the uh, the Gucci family. So I watched that Lady Gaga. Um, she was very good. So in the movie, 
is Jeremy Irons. He plays the father of uh, Adam Driver's character. And, and he had on an ascot every day. He was a very, very sophisticated gentleman, and he wore an ascot every day. And I just saw a movie, or it was a really good miniseries called Gaslit. I don't know if anyone's seen that, but it's starring uh, Julia Roberts. She is Martha Mitchell, and her husband is played by Sean Penn. It's a very good series. And anyway, there um, it's about Watergate and John Dean is going to testify before Congress and his wife in the movie uh, is a very beautiful woman and she wears going into court for, or going into Congress for her husband John Dean to testify. She has her scarf on like an ascot. So and that was taking place in the 70s. So yes, so to answer our, our um, viewers question, yes, it was very much in favor for men several decades ago. Um, you could wear it today, yes. And in the 70s, women were wearing it. So you wanna bring it back? I think it's a cool look. I kind of like it myself. And uh, there again, it's pretty warm. You know, if you have a silk scarf, they can be hot. So you might wanna wait until this heat wave's over, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great look. It kicks way up what is quote unquote a casual outfit. So that's kind of fun. And I thought we'd just take just a few moments here. I'm not gonna take your whole evening. I know you have so many things to do, but I would like to talk about traveling today. Having just um, made a trip abroad, I have not been abroad since COVID and turns out nobody else has either. And it's a nightmare out there. Let me just tell you. So let's talk about etiquette, how to stay polite while you are traveling. I have a few tips for you. Get there to the airport early. You cannot get there early enough. Simply put, you absolutely cannot. You have no idea what security is going to be if you're going abroad or if you're coming back into the country, if you're coming, been abroad, coming back in the United States. Security can be an hour or six hours. You don't know. You just, you don't know. It is, it's tough. It's tough right now. So, etiquette, respectful, understand. The world is short-staffed. The entire world, especially airports, the airline industry is short-staffed. There are gonna be delays. There will be cancellations. There will be long, long, long queues. There will be confusion. There will be frustration. Get in this mindset. I don't mean to be a real downer, but I just want you to, to get in the mindset that, okay, you know, everybody that's here is trying hard. Everybody's working really hard. And I've just got to, to roll with it and just know I'm going to get there eventually. Just, just roll with it. So. Get in the right mindset and understand that everybody from security to everybody is trying hard and it's crowded. Uh, I've not seen airports so crowded as on this past trip that we just got back from. It was, it was really something else. It was really crowded. Um, you know, lots of cancellations and people are just stuck in airports and, and it's so just get in the right mind. Um, Judgment-free zone, there's no room for judgment in etiquette. People wearing masks, not wearing masks, you do you. That's my advice. And do your homework before you go. Do your homework. I have a few really, really good tips for you. So one thing, a great website, if you're gonna go, say you're traveling abroad, to get up-to-date information What's required? What do I need? Do I need a, te a COVID test? Do I need a, my car? Do I, what, what do I need? Where am I going? Okay, go to this, joinsherpa.com. Sherpa, just like you're thinking, you know, in the Himalayans, a Sherpa. Join, J-O-I-N, joinsherpa.com. They have a really great interactive map. It can help you tremendously know what you're going to need. And then depending on your airline that say, we just flew American and they have the um, One World uses something called Verifly. 
and that was easy peasy. It was, um, I put in all the COVID cards. I did all this, everything's approved, pictures, everything. So you just sailed through that. That made it really very easy. And depending on your airline, I know um, Delta has something, their own thing. Delta's is um, fly ready. And so just check, check your airline and that will have that done. There are forms if you're going to Europe that need to be done, filled out. So have all that done in these apps and they're free and it will save you so much grief. I saw people at the airport suitcases open frantically looking for the paper, looking for this. They didn't do it online before they left. So check, do your homework before you leave and then it's, it, it, trust me, it'll save you. Sign up for TSA PreCheck, sign up for Global Entry. Will help you tremendously. And those are a couple of really good travel tips for you. And just be polite, just realize even the flight attendants, the flight attendants are short staffed and they might, you might not get the attention you were hoping for. And you know, you just, we just, I think all of us, all of us in the world here, you know, global citizens, we need to just take a chill, just deep breaths, chill, just appreciate the experience of travel and seeing another culture and appreciate that aspect and just know everybody's trying hard to get you where you want to go. And don't check a bag, carry-ons only. Okay, I hope that's a little bit of good uh, travel info for you. If you have any questions at all, I would be so happy to answer them. And um, otherwise, I think that it's been lovely to be with you and I would love any comments, please, because we're thinking about doing these maybe once a week, every, you know, bi-monthly. I don't know, what do you think? I, I'd love to know what you think. What would you like to talk about? I love getting uh, these comments and questions um, via YouTube. So please, I'd love to answer them. I answer everyone, I read everyone, and uh, this live is, is kind of fun. I want to create this sense of community and help everybody. Maybe, you know, we can understand, don't take yourself so seriously. Be kind, be a, a good, decent person, and the rest of it's all gonna fall into place. You know, that's what etiquette's really about. So. Thank you so much for tuning in. Um, I so much appreciate it. I wish you a marvelous rest of your evening. And as I always say, please be kind and subscribe to the channel. Thanks so much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Au revoir.